Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Nathan Metter. I'm the senior pastor at St. John Lutheran Church in Plymouth, Wisconsin. I also have the privilege of serving as the assistant coordinator for stewardship for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And it has been, it's a great honor to be able to uh, share with you God's word during this Advent season for your virtual chapel. I want to share with you some words and thoughts from Isaiah chapter 61. And, and what these words talk about are words of promise. And, and promises are all over in our world today. Uh, we go through an election cycle and we hear politicians make promises. We hear uh, President Trump wants to make America great again. Uh, uh, President Biden would want to build back better. In 1980, Ronald Reagan said there was mourning in America. And way back in 1928, Herbert Hoover promised two chickens in every pot and two cars in every garage. See, but these are political promises, and we know what usually happens with them. But it's not just politicians that have a problem with promises. It's husbands and wives who make promises before the altar of God to love and to cherish until death parts them. It's, it's uh, parents who bring their, fa- their children to the waters of holy baptism, promising to bring them up in the fear and instruction of the Lord. It's Confirmands who, can, who don their flowers and their white robes and make the confession of faith that they would rather die than leave this confession. And yet, and while these promises sound so much more sanctified than political promises, they often end up in the same category. These promises are broken because divorces happen and baptized children often don't see the ch- church again until confirmation classes start. And those wonderful confirmands maybe many like many of you they confess their faith and then they cash their checks and they're off following worldly goals promises whether they're sanctified or not are often broken so when we turn our attention to the prophet isaiah and we hear him speak words of promise it's not too hard for us to become skeptical He says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those that are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the vengeance of our God. These are words of promise because of the one who speaks these words. They're not spoken by a politician or a parent or a spouse or a confirmand. No, they're not even spoken by the prophet. These are words spoken of the one anointed for the very purpose of living out God's greatest promise. You see, the key is that word anointed. For for that root word in Hebrew is the word for Messiah. These are the words of promise from God himself. Jesus the Christ is the word in the flesh, and he comes to proclaim first with his lips and then with his life, death, and resurrection that he is the fulfillment of that great promise. And he brings with him a message of good news. And good news is something we need so desperately, especially when you hear who he's talking to. He's talking to the poor, and and we know that there's there's not a lot of good news and a lot of promise in poverty. But the real good news that this anointed one is talking about is to those who are poor toward God, those who are broken and battered by the guilt and shame of their sin, they come with, they come with the promise that they will be fully restored. And when the anointed one talks about freedom to the captives, we get excited. After all, we Americans treasure our freedoms But when an Israelite heard about freedom, they weren't thinking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No, they were thinking about another word, the word jubilee. You find that uh, jubilee in Leviticus 25, where it talks about on the Day of Atonement, a trumpet would would sound, and everything in the community would have what computer gurus call a complete reset. Ownership of land would go back to the original people. Debts would be canceled. Slaves would be declared free. Everything would go back to the way God intended it. And it was a wonderful system that God set up. But the reality is, there's good indication that it was never once done in all of Israel. And you can understand why. The idea of restoration and reset are great, unless you're the one who's amassed a fortune. If you're the one who was required to give away that which you gathered up, you would not be so excited about a year of imposed grace. Doesn't sound like good news, does it? Especially if you've made an idol out of your things. 
See, that was Israel's problem, and it's our problem too. We grow far too attached to things and not nearly attached enough to God. And God's just too jealous for that. And that's why Israel needed to be exiled, and that's why you and I need to hear God's law. We need to understand the shackles that bind us so that we can appreciate the freedom that the Anointed One comes to give us, especially from our greatest slave master, death itself. This Anointed One came to proclaim this good news. In fact, he is the good news. And in his life, death, and resurrection, we hear of a -a one-of-a-kind jubilee. There was no trumpet, but an earthquake. And when that earthquake happened, God hit the reset button. No longer would the poverty of our sin hold us. No longer would our sin-broken hearts languish under guilt and shame. The shackles of the captivity of the grave would fall away. Our prison doors would fly open like they did for Paul and Philippi. And this promise is not an end in itself. The anointed one clothes us, and he dresses us for action. Here's how he says it, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Our Lord promises both to Israel and to us that he would dress us in priestly garments for his service. In baptism, he washes away the ashes of our sin, and the the oil of gladness rolls down us, and it ordains us for a ministry of praise. We're vested in the robes of Christ's righteousness so that we might serve him. And then he plants us to be oaks of righteousness, firmly rooted in his word, so that we wouldn't be so easily deceived like our first parents were in the garden. The anointed one, the Messiah, comes to bring this promise of divine restoration to you and to me. To those of us in the poverty of sin and the captivity of death, this is the greatest news. In fact, every time you're in church, when you see a pulpit, an altar, or a font in action, my good friend Dr. Reed Lessing says that's history in the making. And you know what that history is? It's the history of promises made and kept. The first promise was made in the Garden of Eden. That promise came to life in the birth of Jesus. It came to a completion at the cross. It was accepted at the empty tomb. And it will find its ultimate culmination when Jesus comes again in glory for us. The promises made by this anointed one, they're like no other. They're promises made and promises kept. There's no uncertainty. It's as good as done. They were certain in the words of Isaiah the prophet. They are certain in the words of the anointed one, Jesus Christ. And they are certain for you forever. We have God's promise on it. That's what Christmas, that's what Easter, that's what Jesus is all about. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.